Hey everyone, thank you for taking the time to watch this uh, recording of how to detect time stopping with CAPE. My name is Andrew Rathbun and uh, I will be presenting today and uh, we'll dive right into it. Before we get started though, uh, here is a upcoming schedule of CAPE training. So feel free to follow the link if you're interested. And let's talk about what we're going to get into today. We're going to talk about what time stopping is, uh, different tools that you can use to time stop files, uh, what the investigative process looks like using CAPE. We're, then we're going to analyze a couple or look into a couple scenarios with new file time and total commander where we time stop with those respective tools. Uh, then we're going to talk about some important considerations with time stopping, show some real life examples of time stopping and talk about some advanced time stopping methods and tools. And here's just a little bit about me. Uh, long story short, I'm a vice president at Kroll in cyber risk right now. I do uh, digital forensic incident response investigations every day, mostly ransomware cases. Uh, prior to that, I was with federal law enforcement. And uh, prior to that, I was local law enforcement um, where I was a, a police officer and a detective. I'm also the administrator of the digital forensics discord server and a contributor on aboutdfir.com. I do a lot of stuff on GitHub. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much about it. Feel free to connect with me there on the bottom left. So let's talk about time stopping. What is it? So it's a common anti-forensic technique observed in instant response matters. Um, I see it very often, probably on 40, 50% of the cases that I work. Um, it's basically where the timestamps on an NTFS file system are, NTFS file system are altered. Uh, for a file. So we're talking the MACB timestamps, the modified access change and birth, which is commonly known as the file creation. So we usually see it in the standard information attribute, which is the 0x10, the hex 10, whatever you want to call it. But the x30, the hex 30, um, the file name attribute can be altered with extra effort knowledge. So why would someone do this? Um, often threat actors will use it to hide tools or the output from their tools from people like me, incident responders, when conducting you know, an analysis of the MFT. You can also use it legitimately because say you download some files way back in the 90s and it's hopped from, you know, one flash drive to another external drive and all the timestamps have gotten manipulated. But for some reason, you want those timestamps to still reflect 1996 when you downloaded it. That's a legit, legitimate use for time stopping. So some people do that. So in this, in this webinar, we're going to cover two different scenarios. Um, we're going to and that's going to provide examples of the most widely used observed techniques that we see at Kroll in our day-to-day -day engagements. And then some examples of detection and analysis techniques using CAPE and Timeline Explorer, two of my favorite tools. So when looking for time stopping, you have to have an investigative mindset. Uh, time stopping is common enough where you're, you should probably expect it on almost every single case that you work. Um, you won't see it on every case, but once you do find it, you are going to find probably multiple instances of it, or at least that's what I've seen in my experience. Um, you really don't know if time stopping is going to be present on a host really until you see it, um, unless you have uh, intel that the particular group or you know the, the ransomware variants that you're dealing with that's a common, you know, that could be a common TTP for that particular um, ransomware group, a TTP being tactics, techniques, or procedures. Um, so normally I discover them based on like a suspicious file name. So like, you know, C drive, music, and then evil.exe, that stands out to me. And then I will notice that, oh, it's time stopped. And then I just pivot on, you know, various um, IOCs there, and I find typically more files that are time stopped. So. And once I've seen on one host, I very often find those same that same fact pattern on different hosts within a client's network. And as with everything, context is king. So plenty of applications don't record the subseconds. We'll get into, into why that's important. Um, yeah, we'll get we'll get further into that. So let's talk about some tools that you can use to timestamp files. One popular one is new file time. Um, we cover it extensively in a blog post series that we recently published, um, I believe it was earlier this month, June 2022. So there's a link to that here on the slide. Um, it's free, it's easy to use. You can modify the modified, created, and access timestamps of really any file. Um, and it can also adopt the timestamp of another file. As you can see, it's a pretty easy to use GUI. Um, we'll get more into it. 
one thing I wanted to bring up, um, whenever I find a tool that does a thing that I like, I like to try and find other tools that do that same thing, just so I'm aware of alternatives. Maybe there's a better one out there. Maybe the one I'm using is the best one. Um, this is a site that I use all the time called alternative2.net. So what I did is I put new file time on alternative2.net. I put it in the search box. And here's some of the other ones that I found. So we're covering new file time in this webinar, but understand that there's multiple other tools that do the same thing. So there they are to the left. And also I want to provide that investigative process for, it's really great for research, right? If you find one particular tool that does something that you're trying to find artifacts on, you know, for like the purpose of a Cape target, for instance, putting that tool in alternative two, you'll find a bunch of other tools that do the same thing. And then you may want to do the research on those tools as well. So if anything gives you ideas. Total Commander, this is a very popular Windows File Explorer alternative. Um, it's a dual pane Windows File Explorer alternative. I think it's one of the oldest ones. Uh, it's got a lot of functionality and extensibility via plugins. Um, it can also be used as a data XFIL tool. There's a plugin, an FTP plugin. You can use that for XFIL. Um, what this GIF here on the right is showing is file change attributes. What I'm highlighting here is that the change attributes option is the first option in the file menu. So that's why this is a popular tool amongst threat actors that are looking to um, obfuscate their activities on a file system is because, I mean, it makes it easy. File, change attributes. And then when this pops up here, you can see you can change the date and time. And then there on the more attributes button on the right, you can add, I actually have a screenshot and a few slides that'll get into that. But this is how you change the, the timestamp of a given file. So. Again, going back to alternative2.net, there's lots of alternatives to this tool. There's tons of File Explorer replacements. I've made Cape targets for almost all of them, and there's a compound target that covers all of those. It's, it's called File Explorer Replacements.tk. Let's talk about our investigative process using Cape. So with Cape, we're going to need to acquire at least the MFT, but we can also grab the dollar sign J, which is the USN journal, or link files. Um, having all three of those, we're, we're gonna cover all three of those in this webinar here. So the NFT is an index of all the files on an NTFS formatted file system. Um, the dollar sign J, it's a journal of all the changes to the file. So it, it doesn't store the actual file contents that are changed. It just stores the fact that, hey, this file was renamed. This file was created, it was deleted, it was, you know, data was added to it, data was removed from it, that sort of thing. So all the above, the dollar sign MFT, the dollar sign J and link files can be acquired using the Cape triage compound target. And so these pictures here are just snips from those respective targets. So just in case you've never looked at a Cape target before, um, you can see the MFT on the bottom left and the middle bottom is dollar sign J and then the link files are on the right. So this GIF right here is my everyday workflow uh, using CAPE. Every system that I run or that I analyze, I at least do this workflow on. And that's the CAPE triage target with the easy parser module. It grabs pretty much everything I need to answer 95% of the questions that I have, at least off the bat. So the GIF is going to start over right here. So I point to my C drive. I have my destination. And then I make sure I select the Cape triage target because I want those files to go into that C temp T out, T out for target out. And then for my module destination, M out for module output. I select easy parser, select CSV. I do debug messages and then I execute. So this workflow will produce output for most artifacts pulled using the Cape triage compound target. Basically Cape triage target and the easy parser module have been married, so to speak, to where so long as the artifact exists, every tool in the easy parser compound module will be put to use. And that is grabbed by the Cape triage target. So here's what our Cape output looks like. So again, the T out is our target destination location. That's just the, the naming convention that I use as T out folder. Um, this is this is going to have all the files that we acquired using Cape targets, and then M out is going to be our module destination location. This is where we'll have all the parsed output from the MFT, dollar sign J, link files, and so on. 
So with this workflow, we have all the raw files and the parsed output for us to use in Timeline Explorer. This particular screenshot here is just with the file system target and the MFT ECMD module ran. It's not Cape Triage Easy Parser. I did it this way because Cape Triage Easy Parser, I, I can't fit that screenshot on this, on this screen here. So the T out folder, and this is just flat view in directory opus. So you can see the folder structure here, T out, C, and all the other subfolders and all the files, you can see where they fall under. Um, and then here's our module output. So this is our parsed output for the dollar sign J, MFT, SDS, and boot. So let's talk about Timeline Explorer. This is one of the best tools for, I think, an incident response examiner, um, really any examiner, quite frankly. Frankly, any CSV that I ever look at, as long as I don't need to edit it, I look at it in Timeline Explorer, be it personal life, professional life, it's just how it works for me. So again, our CAPE workflow acquires files, generates output from those files, and then we use Timeline Explorer to analyze that. Personally, I think it's the best companion for people like me, examiners who rely on CSV output, be it from Easy Tools or really any other tool. Some commercial tools can generate CSV output, and I look at it in Timeline Explorer. So it's built by an examiner, Eric Zimmerman, for examiners like us. And you can open much larger files than Excel can handle. I think Excel has like a million and some line limit that it'll actually display. I've had easily 9 million lines in a CSV in Timeline Explorer. I've opened up 14 gigabyte CSVs. Excel just can't handle that. Excel is a great application. It's not a forensic tool. Um, so this is a forensic tool. Strongly recommend you check it out. And uh, my guide there is on the bottom. That's hosted on about DFIR for Timeline Explorer. Lots of GIFs on, I believe, page two. So let's talk about analysis with Timeline Explorer for the new file time tool that we covered earlier. So here we're going to be doing time stopping analysis for uh, the MFT in the new file time scenario. So here in this one, you can see that I'm setting the time here on this top pane to the year 2000, 2005, and 2002 for all these respective timestamps. And you can see the times are actually one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and then the files that I'm going to be going to be affecting is evilfile.exe and eviloutput.txt. I made this scenario because it's some one that I see very commonly in engagements that I work. Threat actor puts a file on disk of a system I'm looking at, and then shortly after it shows up on disk, you see some output.log.txt that shows up. And that's just them running the tool, the output's generated, likely a network scan or what have you. But that's, that's why I made this this uh, scenario the way it is. Also, the C music folder, that folder should exist on no one system, so it should stand out. You should know that that's not where your music folder is. So um, going to the slide here, timestamps and new file time are gonna be in local time, okay? This is something I didn't learn until I actually already did these slides. I was trying to make the timestamps one, two, three, four, five, six. Turns out that, you know, this actually is local time and not UTC, so our timestamps are gonna be one, six, three, four, five, six. I tried. <laughs> so um, if we do temporal analysis of the MFT timestamps, it would show that evilfile.exe and eviloutput.txt are created much earlier than they actually were. And I'm going to show you that here in this next slide. So this is a GIF here. So this is me looking at the MFT ECMD output. So it's filtered on these two files. You can see here, there's the timestamp timestamps under the X10 columns, okay? So if you see the zeroed out subseconds, those are the, the ones that are time stopped and we'll let it loop back one more time. So we have the music folder, evil output, evil file. You can see the created timestamps there, 2005, and then those are the actual timestamps. Time stopped and those are the actual timestamps. There's time stopped timestamp right there. So. All right, so next, this goes. This shows an example of me pivoting. So if you look, I have, I normally sort on the created timestamps. So if you if you see, I do that. Like, I I never look. I would never think to look in 2005, right? Because the incident just happened, let's say, two months ago. So if you're only looking at one timestamp column, I mean, you're gonna be you're gonna miss these because um, you're looking around June of you know 2022 or you know April 20 2022. 
but these files look like they're from 2005. Well, if you look at that created X30 column, that's where you're actually going to see when these files showed up. So you can see here, when we're sorted on the timestamp there, see we're seeing June 10. These are all the things that showed up June 10. But if we are sorting on this column here, see, we're back in like 2005, and these are some really old files. Or at least the timestamps indicate that they are old files. So this is just showing pivoting um, on the two different timestamps within the created X10 column and the created X30 column. And also this is showing how I'd normally find it because the, the music folder is odd and obviously evil file stands out, evil output. And then you can see the difference in the timestamps there. So moving on. Looking at the dollar sign J uh, for the new file time scenario, I, I cannot say enough good things about the dollar sign J. So long as it exists and so long as it covers the time frame of interest. I have seen the dollar sign J only cover a few hours. Uh, actually, just today, literally, I saw one that only covered a few hours uh, from when we when we pulled the dollar sign J. I've also seen it go back as far as two plus years of file system activity. That was super helpful because my the incident I was I was investigating did not happen two years ago. It happened you know three months ago or whatever. Um, very helpful to have that much visibility. So so long as it exists and covers your time frame of interest, you need to look at it. Sometimes it doesn't exist, and that's a bummer. Uh, but it is what it is. There's enough other artifacts to look at, but if this one does exist, it's it's awesome. So, all right, this picture here on the right is, for this scenario, the evil file and the evil output, when I was time stomping it with new file time, I time stomped both files, but I forgot to do those check boxes for the, the times, the one, two, three, four, five, six. I forgot to do that. So I did that at 1741 UTC on June 10th. I didn't realize until later when I was going back and working on the slides again, uh, I noticed that the timestamps actually didn't have the zeroed out subseconds. So I had to go back and re-timestamp re them. So I did that here at 2131. What's cool about this picture is you can see two clear examples. I'm telling you what happened because I did it. I was the one who pulled the trigger on it. This is what one instance of timestamping looks like in the dollar sign J. And this is another instance and they look identical to me. So this is a sorted on time here, timestamp in ascending order. And so this is a fact pattern that you can now ingrain in your brain of what time stopping should look like in the dollar sign J. So on a live system, you can see what your dollar sign J looks like your USN journal by running this FSUtil USN query journal C drive. And then on an image, you can just look at the C dollar sign extend dollar sign USN journal, and then it's the alternate data stream, dollar sign J. Actually, the dollar sign max should have the value of what the maximum size of the dollar sign J should be. All right, let's look at link files here for new file time. Kind of a lot going on on the slide, so we'll take it step by step. So after I created evil output.txt, so I created a file, right click new text document, called it evil output, right? No link file exists yet because it hasn't been opened. So I opened it and it generated a link file. It would be eviloutput.txt.lnk. So in this scenario, I actually time stomped that file before I ever opened it for the first time. So I want to provide that context because that is going to explain what we're seeing here on the right. So let's start with the first picture on, on the top right. Here we have the timestamps from me parsing the link file after I opened evilOutput.txt for the first time, which as a reminder, I had already time stopped it. So we are seeing that the target timestamps, which point to the file that the link file is pointing to, are 2005, 2000, 2002. This is actually when I created the file here around this time frame. These these are definitely time stopped timestamps. All right. Let's go to the second one. So this is the, the link file output upon time stopping again, but I did not open it, okay? So what I'm demonstrating here is that we see these exact same timestamps here, one, six, three, four, five, six, my poor attempt at one, two, three, four, five, six. These didn't change from one and two, even though I time stomped the file. So what this is illustrating is that the file, the files, or the link files timestamps do not get updated for the target file until it's already opened again. And we'll, we'll 
keep going here with the story. So number three, we see the link file. It's the parse link file output upon opening it after I time stomped it. So I did something a little ridiculous this time. I time stomped it to 2040, 2030, and 2050 just to make things stand out. All right. So I time stomped it and then I opened it and then I parsed it. You can see now the timestamps reflect the time stomped values. So let's go to number four. So I parsed the link file again, but that was after time stomping them to 1975, but I didn't open them again. So here is a screenshot of what my new file time looked like. I, I time stomped all these, these two files to 1975 and I didn't open them. So that means the link file metadata doesn't get updated. And this is illustrating that, that, that very fact that link file metadata does not get updated until the file is opened. Just period. Doesn't matter if you've time stomped it or not. So here we find that link files refresh the metadata upon opening of a target file after time stopping occurred. So that's a really interesting finding. You could technically use link files as kind of like a validator of, hey, did this file get opened after it was time stopped? So did threat actor time stop it? And then did they for some reason open it afterwards? A link file should be able to tell you that. All right, we're going to do the same thing with the total commander scenario. We're going to go to the MFT, dollar sign J, and link files. So here's the MFT. So the timestamps in total commander here on the right, you can see in that change attributes dialog window. Uh, this is what I was talking about earlier. When you hit more attributes here, it shows a plugin drop down here and then all these properties. Pretty much every property of a file is going to be in that drop down right there. So the creation date, the modified access, every everything is going to be there. And you can change the value of it. So that's what that looks like. On the bottom here, you can see the timestamps and UTC. So again, total commander is Eastern Standard Time, my time zone, and the bottom is going to be UTC. So I time stomped bstrings.exe back to 2011, as you can see here. Creation date, 2011. Now, again, if we were to do temporal analysis of the MFT, we would see B strings as created in 2011, right? If we're filtering or if we're sorting on the, the X10 the standard information attribute. Um, here you can see what it looks like here in MFT ECMD filtered on B strings. You can see 2011, 128, 210310. That matches this, 160310. Um, Total Commander and most other tools can only modify just this timestamp here, the standard information attribute. So this is the actual file creation. This is actually when I created B strings, or at least when B strings was created on my file system. Is going to be that uh, file name timestamp here, 0x30. Dollar sign J, it's going to be a similar fact pattern to what we saw a couple slides ago. So the dollar sign J, again, provides an awesome play by play of what happened uh, when you filter on B strings here. You see these basic info changes, and you can see the timestamps of when these, these actually happened. And then link files, it was the same behavior. Um, I added a GIF here just to illustrate the the creation of the link file when you first open a, a, a file. So right here, I just opened up webinar demo test file. So you can see these top two files here were created. So here's the beginning of the GIF. I open the file, okay, close it just so you can actually see. And then there's the link file for the file itself and the parent folder because that was in my downloads folder. So some of the key takeaways from uh, link file analysis, the source timestamps refer to the link file itself. So source modified is gonna be the last time that a file was opened and the source created is gonna be the first time that a, a file that a link file is pointing to is opened. The target timestamps refer to the file that the link file is pointing to. And the link files, again, are only created upon the first time that a file is opened. Uh, the link files is created for the file opened itself and the parent folder, which is what we see in this GIF here. Um, and again, the source modified provides the last modified timestamp of the link file, which indicates the last time that that target file was opened. And then timestamps within the link file are only updated once the target file is opened, which we illustrated on that slide with the four screenshots, one through four. And link files, therefore, do not appear to be refreshed 
in real time. Uh, so if you timestamp a file, or time stomp a file, excuse me, <laughs> if you time stomp a file, that's not going to be reflected in the link file until that file is opened. So it's an indicator technically of file access. All right, here's a little pop quiz. Uh, can you spot the timestamp bstrings.exe file? Now, you're probably thinking, why in the world do I have so many instances of bstrings on my forensic computer? And the answer is, I have no idea. But if you got a second to take a look at this, you will notice all these timestamps here in the in the X10 column, so the standard information attribute. If there aren't timestamps here, that means they're identical. Okay, so this just lets ones that are different stand out. So these two. So if we focus on these two, we can look over here, and based on what we learned about zeroed out subseconds, we're going to see that this is going to be the timestamp time stamped one, 2011-01-28-21-03-10 10 and then zero dot subseconds. This is the actual time uh, when it was when it was created. So that second from the bottom is going to be our, our time stopped B strings. So the thing with judging by the zero dot subseconds, um, you're going to find a lot of false positives. So on the MFT of the system that I'm presenting from right now. Um, when I do what's in this GIF right here, so these are the last three columns all the way to the right on MFT ECMD output. These are not MFT features. This is just Eric doing the math, so to speak, and giving you indicators, kind of like uh, helpers for, you know, time stopping, file copy events, or what have you. Um, the USEC zeros column is going to filter on all the files that have zeroed out subseconds in one of the timestamps okay when you do that look on the bottom there on the bottom right so total lines in the mft there's you know over 3 million there's almost 1.7 million that fit that criteria i can promise you no one time stomped 1.7 million files on my mft of the system i'm presenting from right now that's just not reality for some reason some applications just don't record subseconds or they don't modify the subseconds. I don't know the answer to that. If you do, shoot me an email. That would be great. I'm sure it has something to do with Windows internals, NTFS internals that I'm not aware of, but for some reason, some applications do, some don't. Even some legitimate Windows files just don't have the subseconds altered. It just is what it is. So this is why context matters. You can't just filter on this column and then blindly say, hey, 1.7 million files were were altered or were time stomped by the threat actor because that is not true. This is why context matters. So again, on the next slide, we're gonna we're gonna talk about an everyday MFT. That's actually I think the MFT for yes for this system. So let's start at step one here. So this is this is the MFT ECMD output. Step one here, you can see all these files and program files, IDM computer. I, I can't remember what the rest of it is. But these are all files related to UE Studio, which is just the text editor that I like using. Um, these files were not time stopped. I can tell you that. I use this program legitimately, but for whatever reason, all of these files and then some have zeroed out subseconds. So these are technically false positives for time stopping. Let's go down to two. Here's just another example of a false positive. Um, that would be just a couple files. Looks like one in my downloads folder and one in the app data folder. For whatever reason, these are these these have zeroed out subseconds. I did not timestamp these files. Let's go to number three here. This is an example of a malicious file that normally would stick out to me when I'm looking at the MFT, right? This dot here is representative of the root of the C drive. So C music, that's not a thing, not on really any computer, at least it shouldn't be. It's usually C users, username, music, right? That's what I would expect. So already the parent path sticks out to me as suspicious. This is obviously a training scenario, so I made it a ridiculous file name, but evilfile.exe would stand out to me as well, and it does. So looking at this, you can see this got time stomped in 2005, and there's a zeroed out subseconds. This is actually when that file was created, and this is, for full transparency, this exe, that I, it's just some exe I had sitting in my downloads folder and I just renamed it. I basically sacrificed an executable and just used it for this example. So I don't even remember what it was, but apparently it, it actually showed up on my file system back on April 8th. 
So I could tell you that this is when this is when that file showed up on the file system, and then this is what I time stopped it to. So this is a good example of just kind of scrolling through the MFT. Um, this is kind of what I see when I'm working engagements. So things pop out at me and I look into them a little bit further and, oh, hey, interesting, this is time stopped. So I would then pivot on sorting on, um, I would sort on this X30 column and I would probably end up seeing other files that are suspicious as well. So this is kind of going back to the link file, file access analysis, you know, was a file opened after time stopping? If a link file reflects the time stop values for a target file that you have seen yourself, then the file was opened after time stopping. The file does not reflect time stop values that you have seen for those files, then they have not been opened after time stopping. So thankfully, LECMD has a dash dash MP switch, which I believe probably means more precision. Um, it provides more precise timestamps. So that's where you're going to see those, those extra subseconds. And I did not have that in the previous slides. Um, but I wanted to make sure I brought that up here. And here you can see the CAPE module that for each you know, CSV, HTML, JSON command, it has that dash dash MP switch. So let's show a couple real life examples of time stomping. With these examples, they are actual snips from CSV output from actual casework, but obviously I changed all the timestamps and anything identifying, but at least you'll see the parent path, the file name, are as close as possible to you know what I actually see in a case. These files actually were on a system; they were time stomped, um, and this is this is what it looked like. So, pretty clear that 2017, you know, that's not the client did not use Advanced Port Scanner. They had never heard of it; they've never used it. It definitely didn't show up on their system five years ago. Um, it actually really showed up on whatever the the created X30 timestamp is which would be, you know, March 4th in this scenario, that's actually when it showed up. So I need to go look at March 4th and see what other things might have been, might have showed up around that time. And I might trip over, you know, a couple other indicators of compromise, uh, some other tools that they were using. But I'll tell you right now, if I filter, if I sort on, you know, if I look in 2017, I'm probably not going to find anything. Obviously, unless they time stomped everything to 2017, but it, they don't normally do that. So. I have seen things time stopped all the way back to 2006 in actual cases. Here's another example. Um, so this is Screen Connect. Uh, Screen Connect is a legitimate tool. I think some businesses use it actually legitimately, you know, and everyday people do as well. Um, it's just another example of it's not a malicious tool, but it can be used in a malicious manner. Um, in this case, the client said they have never used Screen Connect, yet these files appear during the time frame of interest. So I can't tell you how many times I've seen this exact scenario before where a client, multiple clients have said, never use Screen Connect, should not be on our network, but here it is. And you see the zeroed out sub seconds, it's to a time frame that is way before, you know, when all the bad activity is going on. So in this scenario here, a lot of the bad activity was going on March 10th, let's say, you know, I obviously changed all these timestamps. Um, but March 10th is when, you know, a lot of bad activity is going on, but they time stopped it to months prior to that, because if you're doing a temporal analysis of the MFT, you're obviously going to look around March 10th, but if I'm not looking at, I, I'm not going to look much further past that. So it's helpful to just, to consider all the timestamps, consider all the context, identify the, the timestamp files, which are typically malicious or they're legitimate tools, but they're used maliciously. Um, so yeah, this is a really great example of that. Let's talk about some advanced time stopping methods and tools. So shout out to Mark Spencer from Arsenal Recon. Um, when I was putting this together, he provided some 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 ideas of what he has seen with uh, with his firm. So here's a couple couple bullet points here. So copying the files to a drive containing one or more NTFS volumes by physically attaching it to an already backdated workstation and extracting the zip or RAR contents whose timestamps have been previously forged. That is quite a quite a mind bender. Uh, that's there's a lot going on in that one, but hey, they've seen that and uh, that is definitely one way to timestamp files. Uh, delivering files using malware that contains an embedded NTFS driver. So what that driver would probably do is manipulate the timestamps, you know, upon 
uh, delivery of whatever payload um, that the malware the, the malware is delivering. And then there's SetMace. Uh, SetMace is a is a tool that I'm actually going to cover on the next slide, but that can actually alter those timestamps in the 0x30 column. Those timestamps that have that I'm saying are typically never altered. You can alter them, but you just have to have the know-how. Um, the, frankly, the patience. The yeah, it's it, it, it. This is not an easy tool to use. This is actually created by one of their one of their um, employees, Joachim Schicht. Um, it's an advanced time stop manipulation tool. I actually toyed around with it, and it was not it was not immediate to use. You definitely need to have some skill. You need to understand, you know, what driver you need, that sort of thing. That's where tools like you know, New File Time, Total Commander, were much easier to use with a nice graphical user interface. But they're they're not as powerful as this command line tool. Um, what this tool actually does is it rebuilds the file system internally to the tool and then writes the new timestamps directly to the physical disk. That is pretty cool. And it uses a kernel driver, which allows it to completely bypass uh, anything that the operating system doesn't want you to do. So, you know, the Windows API completely bypasses that. And it can change the 0x10 and the 0x30 timestamps. Way more advanced than anything like New File Time, Total Commander, or any of the other alternatives that I talk about. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is, why go through all this effort if you're a threat actor if something like new file time, total commander, and some tools I'm going to cover coming up, why not just use those? They're easier. Um, you're very likely only going to see this tool being used by highly motivated actors, typically probably in you know highly sensitive environments. So I included a link to the tool there on GitHub if you want to toy around with it. So this is actually our last slide. I just want to cover a couple other tools that have time stopping capabilities that are commonly seen in IR engagements. So Metasploit actually has a time stop module, and then there's a screenshot of it right there. Um, Cobalt Strike, very commonly seen in, um, in intrusions. Uh, they added a time stop beacon back in 2014. So I wanted to include that data point just so you know how long that that has been a capability within Cobalt Strike. And then there's a little screenshot from the site. And then there's another one that I came across too called End Time Tools. It's a time stomper and time stamp checker with nanosecond accuracy. So that's just another another tool that was not on Alternative 2, but it was one I stumbled upon on GitHub. And I'm sure there's more out there, but I at least wanted to provide um, this one just in case anyone wants to toy around with it. Because really the best way to learn about this stuff is to tinker with it yourself and understand how it works, do it yourself, and then try to detect it, you know, pull those artifacts, time stomp something, grab the MFT, parse the MFT, look at the MFT, what did you do, can you see what you did, and uh, that's that's how you learn. So with that, that is pretty much all we have, and uh, thank you very much for your time, and I hope this was helpful. Um, if you have any feedback, feel free to provide it to cape at kroll.com, otherwise uh, look out for the next webinar that will come out eventually. All right, thank you, everyone, and be safe.